Hi, welcome to chapter number four regarding contract law and the hospitality business. I'm going to go over a very brief overview of chapter number four. The rest of the information will be found in your book as well in some lecture parts of the semester. So let's talk about what a contract actually is. It's an agreement between two or more parties that's enforceable in court. That means it's a legal document that may occur um, in the court to discuss. So it has to be a very important aspect of your business because most items are very contract orientated. These are the different elements of a contract which we'll discuss. Um, and this is when you don't perform part of your contract or the other person does not perform the other side of the contract. This is when there is legal issues that may arise. So. If a contract is, has occurred, what is legal and what is not legal? First of all, if the person was a minor under the age of 18, they were highly intoxicated, mentally incompetent, um, that means that contract does not exist. That was an unfair type of contract to occur, so therefore there is no contract. Um, all parties to the contract are interested in the terms and are intended to enter the agreement. That means you can't have one group or one person that's not interested in the contract, therefore there is no contract. There has to be a give and take relationship in regards of the contract. Responses to an offer, you either accept or you counter offer. You may hear counter offer a lot in regards to real estate and property. Um, however, this can occur in general contracts. For example, you make a contract to make a cost of some type of widget of $10 per widget and you want it to actually be $8.52. That would be a counter offer. Price fixing. Um, competing hotels agree among themselves to each charge the same amount for a room. Not a good thing. Antitrust laws, which we'll probably go into more detail, is also a bad thing that we'll be discussing further in detail. So, is a oral contract enforceable? The general rule is yes, but it can be very, very difficult to, um, to actually prove because it's he said, you said, said issue, and that can be a problem. Right. Statute of the Frauds, this is um, to prevent the perpetuation of a fraud by someone claiming that a contract exists when in fact none does. Statute of Frauds, there's basically stating that some contracts have to be in writing, period. End of story. If it's not in writing, it does not exist and it's not enforceable. As you can see, this is a very long chapter. Um, all of these slides are available on Blackboard, so if I go through some of these quite quickly, you'll know which ones that you need to cover on your own. Ambiguous terms is something that we'll probably discuss further in class and that you'll have some experience with. Terms should not be ambiguous. That means they're not up front and they're not clear, which can cause a lot of confusion, which means one party not, may not fulfill their duty and vice versa. And then this can also occur um, to create some major problems and then you end up in court. So very, very important. Also on contracts, be aware that there is trade usage going on and that sometimes if you use those terms and then you take it to court, then the jury and the judge may be confused about what that trade usage may be. Uh, contracts formed on the internet, we know all about this. This will be another uh, major discussion later on. Breach of contract, that means you failed to actually finish the contract or the other side for, failed to do so. What happens if you don't finish the contract? Basically, damages occur in specific performance, meaning they will be asked to finish the rest of what they were supposed to do. Specific performance usually occurs in something like um, building, um, items where they were building maybe three-fourths of the way they never finished. Um, for example, they finished the master suite, but they forget the toilet. Then you're going to ask them to finish making of the toilet. That would be a specific performance. Compensatory damage, some of the money necessary to cover the loss. Um, but usually the non-breaching party is not entitled to for pain and suffering, which is in negligence. Duty to mitigate, that means the plaintiff seeking to collect the damages, whether it's specific performance or money that they lost. 
that um, that they actually attempted to mitigate this loss, which means reduce or lessen what they're requesting for in court. Punitive damages, a sum of money sometimes awarded to a plaintiff, in excess of compensa compensatory damages, and meant to punish the defendant for wanton or malicious behavior. That means very, very bad, evil behavior. Specific performance, I went over briefly. Um, Contracting for a room, this is very specific to your wards or field. Contract for a room between an innkeeper and guests must satisfy the essential elements. Most contracts for hotel rooms begin with an invitation to negotiate from a would-be guest. Contracting for a room should be in, in writing and should include the dates, duration of stay, applicable rate, special needs of the guest. Overbooking and breach. The hotel reservation once made and confirmed constitutes a contract, binds the hotel to provide accommodations. Accommodations mean your stay, a bed, a bathroom, usually. Overbooking, sometimes the hotel overbooks. For the guests um, the hotel cannot house, it will be a breach of contract and liable for damages. Usually they'll look for another hotel for them to send their overbooked guests to. Goodwill, they're basically stating that if you do this, this is not very good marketing for your hotel. So therefore, you really need to be really careful about this overbooking issue because then once you upset the customer, the chances of them returning become much slimmer. So as we go on through all these different types of more information regarding contract law, Catering contracts is something else I want to skip over to. Catering um, are, it's a contract with a caterer or restaurant for food. There's no excuse for not having it written in the contract. It must be written. It should be. And then look at figure 4-1 in the textbook. These are the items that should be included in the contract. Um, you will be doing an assignment in regards to this, so be prepared to look over it and have a draft of 4-1 that you want to come to class with and you're going to be discussing that with probably another person. Convention contract, kind of the same type of uh, reference. There's an example, figure 4-2. And that is it. Thank you for joining me for this chapter 4. I look forward to seeing you in class.